What the heck is a p-value? Let's find out. Let's draw a continent and an island. Let's give them some color, and let's call the continent population land, and let's call the island sample island. In between is the inferential sea, which is very dangerous and treacherous to cross. Let's populate population land, and let's sample population land, and bring the sample over to sample island. On Sample Island, we can randomly allocate the participants into two or more groups and do an experimental study, or we could observe two or more naturally occurring groups and do a non-experimental study or observational study. Regardless of the study, we will probably run a statistical test and we will calculate a p-value. So let's say we did that. Let's say we ran our test and the p-value was 0 0.02. We compare this p-value to our alpha level. In this case, or in most cases, alpha is 0 0.05. There are certainly a lot of exceptions, but usually 0 0.05. In this case, p is less than 0 0.05, so we reject the null. So we said there was a, quote, significant difference. If on population land, the null is false, we've made the correct decision. Let's say, based on what we saw on Sample Island, P was 0 0.02. 0 0.02 is less than alpha, which is 0 0.05, and we reject the null hypothesis. What if in population land, the null hypothesis is actually true? In this case, we've said there was a significant difference or significant finding, and there actually wasn't a significant difference or significant finding among populations. We have now committed a type 1 error. Let's say instead of 0 0.02, we end up with a p-value of 0.15. We compare 0.15 to our alpha level. 0.15 is greater than 0 0.05. And so we accept the null hypothesis. In overpopulation land, if the null hypothesis is actually true, then we have made the correct decision. But what does it mean if we calculate a p-value of 0.15 and we accept the null hypothesis? Does this mean that the null hypothesis is actually true? This is a common interpretation of the p-value, and it's actually wrong. The answer is that we just didn't find enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Remember, we're on Sample Island. We don't know what's going on in population land. Over in population land, the null hypothesis might be true, or it might be false. We don't know. Along those lines, let's say we calculate a p-value of 0.15 and we accept the null hypothesis. Let's say our power level, 1 minus beta, was 0 0.40. Well, this means that if the null hypothesis was false over in population land, we only would have had a 40% chance of determining whether it was false. So power is an important factor to consider. Let's say that we calculate a p-value of 0.15. We compare it to our alpha level of 0.05, and we've accepted the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is false. In this case, we've committed a type 2 error. The level of type 2 error that we're willing to live with in studies is beta. The level of type 1 error that we're willing to live with in studies is alpha. Power is 1 minus beta. So this may seem a little bit funny to you. P-values are really important. A lot of studies, publications, and grants are based on finding a significant difference. But you may have realized from this video that all we have to look at is what's going on on Sample Island. And we're trying to make guesses about what's happening over in population land. The truth of it is that we don't know what's going on in population land. In reality, there is no such thing as population land. Population land is actually something called a cumulative distribution function. What the heck is a cumulative distribution function? Let's take a look at the example of an independent samples t-test, one of the more basic statistical testing procedures, to try and demonstrate what this actually means. So we have two independent groups. In group one, there's a mean of 20, a standard deviation of 5, and 20 participants. 
In group two, we also have 20 participants with a mean of 24 and a standard deviation of six. Well, you don't have to worry about the formula because the computer does the math for you, but this is the formula for an independent samples t-test with equal variances assumed. So we take the data from our participants on sample island and we plug them into this equation and we get a t-statistic. In this case, our t-statistic is 2.29. And the 38 there you see in parentheses is the degrees of freedom, which for an independent samples t-test is the sum of the two groups minus two. Okay, so we did all that work on sample island and we took all that data from them we plugged them into our equation and we ended up with this T statistic. This T statistic for this testing procedure is how we get our P value. How does that happen? Let's take a look. This is the cumulative distribution function with critical values for a two tailed independent samples T test with alpha set at 0 0.05. Well, what does that mean? This means that we're assuming the distribution of values of whatever we're studying in the population follows this distribution. Based on this distribution, under the null hypothesis, we would have a probability of 0 0.025 of observing a T statistic of 2.02 .02 or more or negative 2.02 .02 or less. The area between, under the curve, between these two points is 0.95. And there's a 0 0.025 chance of getting something on this side of the curve or this side of the curve. This 0 0.025 and this 0 0.025 results in a p-value of 0 0.05. So 1 minus this area under the curve is 0 0.05. That is essentially how we calculate statistical significance. Now, this distribution changes based on the degrees of freedom. And this is the distribution for 38 degrees of freedom. We calculated, if you'll remember, a T statistic of 2.29. Assuming the t distribution, under the null hypothesis, we'd have a probability of 0 0.014 of observing a t statistic of 2.29 or higher, and we would have a probability of 0 0.014 of finding a t-statistic of negative 2.29 or lower. One minus the area between these two regions is our p-value, in this case 0 0.028, or the sum of this number and this number. Now remember, we're using a two-tailed test because we're not assuming a difference going one way or the other before we start our study. And usually you should use two-tailed tests unless you have a very good reason for not doing that. Okay. So that's why we're looking at values both on the lower end and the higher end. So this process all seems very, very legitimate, right? We've calculated our t-test, we've chosen the correct distribution, and we've calculated the area under the curve, and 1 minus that area under the curve gives us our p-value. But let's take a look at this a little more closely. Remember, we found a t-statistic of 2.29. Our critical value, which is depicted in red, was 2.02 .02 and negative 2.02. .02. And so let's say by some quirk of the data, we ended up with a p-value of 2.01 or negative 2.01. Now our value is here, on the other side of the line. So if it was here, we'd say there's a significant difference between these two groups, or this treatment was efficacious, or this risk factor resulted in disease. But on this side of the line, we say there's no difference. There's no evidence that this treatment was efficacious. 
There's no evidence that this risk factor leads to disease. Does that seem funny to you? It should. And where did this 0 0.05 level come from? Well, it turns out it's somewhat arbitrary. There's nothing sacred about this 0 0.05 number. So null hypothesis significance testing has a lot of issues. And we're just going to review some of them before we finish. So what the heck a p-value is not is the following. Number one, it is not a measure of significance, clinical significance, or relevance. If p equals 0 0.04, it doesn't mean the treatment that you examined is going to have any effect on patients. P-values are not so meaningful with large samples. Remember our formula for the independent samples t-test. Remember that n was in the denominator of the denominator. And if you have thousands of people in your sample, any difference between groups is going to be significant. The p-value is not the probability of the null hypothesis. It's only the probability of finding the results that you observe or something more extreme under the null hypothesis. It assumes that you can know whether the null hypothesis is true, and in reality, we don't actually ever know whether the null hypothesis is true. We just assume it for our calculations. By the same token, the p-value is not the probability that the results were due to chance. This is an explanation that is intuitively appealing to students, but one that's not technically true. The p-value is not a measure of magnitude or treatment effect. It tells you nothing about whether a treatment is going to actually make a difference for patients. A medication that with lowered blood pressure by three millimeters of mercury, even if it was a statistically significant reduction, is not going to help your patients. So what do we do? We throw up our hands. We went through all this trouble to calculate a p-value, and now I'm telling you that it doesn't mean as much as you think. Well, first, I wouldn't throw p-values out because if you don't have them, then anyone could call any result significant. But what you need to do is interpret them with caution and consider some of these complementary statistics. If your outcome is measured in meaningful units, like millimeters of mercury for blood pressure or distance ambulated, or anything else, or a range of motion in degrees, or anything else clinically relevant, a confidence interval can tell you a lot. And confidence intervals can actually be used in place of an independent samples t-test. When units don't make so much sense in terms of clinical relevance, like scale scores, or when you're pooling results from several studies, then effect sizes can be very helpful. You can also consider measures like the minimal clinically important difference, the smallest difference that would make a difference to patients in a meaningful way, or their clinicians in a meaningful way, or the minimum detectable change, which is the change above and beyond measurement error or random variation. Consider all of these complementary statistics in addition to a hypothesis tests and then you'll get a much more complete picture. Remember that even these complementary statistics make a lot of assumptions and have their own issues. So by examining several of them, you reduce the chance that you are misinterpreting the p-value or giving it weight that it should not have. I hope you found this helpful.